bing ba. They be the king ha. Now, what y'all won't do? Wanna be ballers? Big shot paper callers. Welcome to the Paper Caller Show. My name is Adam Young, the founder of Ringba, and today I have Ashok Kamal, the executive director of Tech Coast Angels. Tech Coast Angels is an angel investment group located in San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. It's the largest in the country. They fund hundreds of millions of dollars worth of startups. And I'm really excited to have him on the show today so that we can discuss more about how people in our industry can take their business to the next level and gain outside funding to do it. So thank you so much for joining us today, Ashok. Thank you, Adam. Good to be here today. Great. So tell us more about Tech Coast Angels and how it operates and just from a high level more information about the organization. Yeah, so we're an angel investing organization. So it's basically a conglomerate of over 150 accredited angel investors just here in San Diego. We have chapters in LA and Orange County as well. And what we do is look for the best companies uh, to invest money in them. It's as simple as that. We focus on technology companies, so in our world that means life science and biotech along with software and material science and clean tech. And we're looking for great seed stage startups to invest money in and then hopefully help as well because this group of 150 people, let's call it, are all successful in their own right. So these are software entrepreneurs, these are uh, pharma executives, and these are C-level corporate people who have 10, 20, 30 years sometimes of experience. So when you get investment from TCA, you're getting not only capital, but you're also getting social capital as well and all of the um, resources that, that comes along with it. And what specifically does accredited investor mean? So it basically means you're a high net worth individual who is dumb enough to invest in startups <laughs> and understand you may lose your money or you may make a lot of money. That's sort of the risk reward sort of trade off. But according to the SEC, so uh, accreditation is an SEC um, you know, qualification, it means that you're sophisticated enough to invest in private companies. Um, and that's why there is a, um, at present, you know, sort of bar for professional angel investing. Great. And that bar is somewhere in the neighborhood of $250,000 a year in income or a million dollars in net worth, correct? That's right, yeah. And then if, uh, for married couples, it's uh, you know slightly different. I think $300,000 uh, combined joint income with the expectation that you will continue to make uh, that level of income or have that <laughs> level of net worth. So if it was a one-time thing, uh, that doesn't qualify you. Uh, and you self-report uh, as an investor. But the idea is if you... Uh, claim to be accredited and you're not, and if something goes wrong with a startup, you're not going to get very far in uh, the, the courts because when you proclaim to be accredited, which is part of the signing of documents you do in investing in a company, if somebody's never invested in companies before, um, you're basically saying, I understand what I'm getting myself into. <laughs> and sometimes that can go not so great. It can. It's a roller coaster just like uh, working at a startup. Uh, it's a roller coaster journey and you know, you're there along for the ride as an investor. Uh, just like uh, as an entrepreneur, you know, there's a lot of uh, ups and downs. It's miracles and disasters that go head to head <laughs> every day, and that's before lunch. And I say that uh, as a former startup uh, founder several times over. So, how many companies throughout Tech Coast Angels have you helped gain funding up to this point? So, I've been with TCA for going on three years now. I invested in a company when I moved to San Diego from New York City. Um, I brought that company to TCA, that's how I got involved. Uh, TCA was restructuring at the time and uh, asked me if I would come on board to um, help run the organization. I'm in that now two and a half years. We funded about 40 to 50 companies, including some follow-on rounds. So we'll have companies that had raised money from TCA in the past that will be doing a bridge round or a new round and you know we'll follow on and participate. One of the principles of angel investing is to keep making bets on the winners. If you can tell that they're winning, um, since obviously a lot of the companies being early stage don't make it to the next stage. Um, so uh, we've done about 40 to 50 financings in my time, maybe about half of that is new companies. Uh, and a typical financing ranges from a half million dollars as a round to uh, we go as big as a million and a half in uh, recent financing. Great. Well, one of the things I think is really interesting about fundraising and the companies we see at Tech Coast Angels, and for those that aren't initiated, I actually chair the technology co committee at Tech Coast Angels, and so I also see all these deals come through, and the number one thing that uh, pops in my head when I see most of these deals that maybe don't get funding is where where's their marketing talent? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, a lot of these companies don't know 
how to sell their product or what they're going to do with it. They can make some great technology or yeah. a great consumer product and then they're just lost and yeah. they can't go out and get users. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing about our industry because it's the complete opposite. Everyone that works in it is usually an extremely creative marketer. Yeah. They know how to acquire tons of users, whether it be B2B or B2C, and yet we never see them come through the funding process. Yeah. And I think part of that is because um, marketers generally are you know, uh, in the trenches mm -hmm. and are fighting their way to success on a daily basis. Yeah and maybe aren't thinking about growing their companies. And this is why I wanted to introduce TCA to our audience yeah. because you know we have all these, these investors that are looking to fund organizations yeah. and there are, uh, is a complete lack of organization yeah. that has the marketing talent that we're really looking for. And my hope here is to bridge that gap and introduce angels to our audience. And so I think that's a great segue into the funding process. Mm -hmm. So if you wouldn't mind, will you please start from beginning to end yeah. and sort of walk us through what a funding process looks like yeah. for uh, an angel investment deal? Yeah. So I'll walk you through sort of the TCA process because it can vary a little bit across their hundreds of angel groups, you know, in the country. And then, of course, there are individuals who are super angels and, you know, it's a very fragmented ecosystem, but it accounts for a lot of the total capital that goes into early stage companies. So as far as TCA goes, we have a process where you basically come in um, often with a referral or through our connections at different incubators and accelerators where we're kind of always sort of you know, pruning the portfolio, looking for companies that we think fit our thesis. Um, then let's say you come in, you do an online application which basically gives us your deck and executive summary and then someone like me and someone smarter like you will look at these applications. On the biotech side we have really smart biotech people that you know basically we want to match the right person to the right company at the right time. So when the company comes in we get the eyeballs on it that first of all understands what they're doing because you want people looking at you know companies that come from or are at least familiar with that vertical. Um, and then if we think there's a fit then we'll have some sort of a meeting with the company. So, you know, we'll either do a one on one or get a few people together and meet with them. We'll do a conference call um, or we'll bring them into, you know, one of our committee screenings, we call it. So, uh, just about every month we run the tech committee, which you chair, and then we have a parallel in life science. And we'll have companies come in, do a short sort of orientation presentation. And then, if we think based on that meeting, there's real legs with the broader group, then we'll ask them to come in and do a, a truly formal presentation, which is, you know, kind of the, the Shark Tank style format without, you know, the jokes and, uh, you know, kind of hopefully the, the mean guys, you know, on the other end of the table. Uh, but what we're looking at there is the business opportunity, the team, the technology, the, you know, sort of the ask for the entrepreneur, don't forget to tell us what you're looking for and what you want to do with the money. Uh, and then if at that point we think there's a deal to be had, we'll go into our final due diligence. For us, that's a 30-day process where we look really under the hood. And you know that can mean from the legal to the financing to the technology, of course. And at the conclusion of that diligence process, which we purport to get done within 30 days, uh, then we'll invest in the company. And that can come from our fund um, and it can come from individual investors. So in, in total, you're usually looking at half a million to a million dollars from TCA when we really like a deal. Great. And what are some things that entrepreneurs coming into this process don't do very well? What are some of the regular problems that you see? Yeah, so I think uh, starting at the uh, kind of targeting your investors as an entrepreneur, it's important to know who you're pitching. You know, so you don't want to go to uh, a group like TCA when you're opening up a coffee shop. Now, obviously, this is a you know sort of technology audience, but for example, there are VCs out there and investors who don't invest in SaaS because they're focused on consumer tech or they're focused on biotech. So understanding your investor, knowing their thesis, you know, is the first, you know, kind of mistake that entrepreneurs make when they don't understand who they're pitching to. I mean, then you want to be prepared. So assume that things go right and that the investors say, hey, this is a deal that, you know, we're interested in. Um, have your cap table ready. Have your financial projections. You know, if you have patents, have your patents. Have your formation documents. The kind of things that investors want to see in due diligence. It's great when you have a deal room, for example, set up virtually, where you can just direct us to uh, a folder that we can go through the documents, which basically are the same across you know investors. Um, if you don't have that preparation, you're going to add time to the process, and time kills deals because things are happening in the industry that could adversely affect you. Uh, yes, you may 
uh, um, benefit from some tailwinds, but headwinds happen all the time as well. And time is generally not going to be on your side. We also have competing deals. So the longer it takes for us to figure out what you're doing, the more other deals that are coming into our funnel and they're taking attention. And that's the scarce resource when you're an entrepreneur pitching investors is you need to keep their attention and being prepared is a good way to do that. So in short, have your shit together. That's a good principle in life <laughs> and in startups. Exactly. And what are some of the behaviors that entrepreneurs exhibit that turn off investors? So I think first and foremost is trust. Mm -hmm. You know, At the end of the day, you're talking about a partnership where people are putting their hard-earned money into companies. And if we don't trust the entrepreneur, we think they're shifty, if they don't answer questions um, straightforwardly, if um, you ask them one question and they answer another, let alone they answer a question uh, in a way that is uh, deceptive, you know, kind of uh, mm -hmm. at best, at worst, outright lying. I mean, those are absolute deal killers. And when you see a lot of deals, like in our case with DCA, you're talking about hundreds of deals a year and we're investing in maybe two or three percent, which is a high proportion of deals for a professional investment group, but nevertheless, it's a obviously small fraction of companies that we see overall. Um, don't give people reasons to put your company in the garbage can. So be trustworthy, be prepared, um, have a concise story that you can tell. Those are best practices. Obviously, the inverse of that is make a complicated pitch that no one can understand what you're doing. That's a deal killer. Um, <laughs> Don't tell people what you want. That's a deal killer. What actually is this person looking for? And what are they planning on using the money for? And when you don't share that with an investor, again, then you're going to make them ask more questions um, that about things that you don't want them asking questions about when you want them focusing on the quality of the company, not simple stuff like how much money you're raising. Sequoia actually has a really amazing example pitch deck mm -hmm. that I like to send to entrepreneurs. Yeah. We'll make sure that we link it at the bottom of the video so that they can go through it. But essentially, it's a standardized pitch yeah. deck mm -hmm. that has all of the basics in there. It's not 10 slides. I think it's 15. Mm -hmm. um, but it allows the entrepreneur to tell a short, concise yeah. story with all of the financial materials that an investor wants to see. Yeah. And I mean, in reality, it is a show. Yeah. You're going up in front of some investors. You need to get them excited about your offering. Yeah. They need to understand the whole business from yeah. start to finish. Yeah. And they only have 15 minutes to do it. That's so it's right. not an easy thing to do. Right. And preparation, like you said, is yeah. just so important yeah. to success. Yeah. And I think that concision is a really important point that you sort of alluded to. Another great example that I often share is the buffer, how we raised a million dollars mm -hmm. deck. So Leo is a friend of mine. We t invested together on a company called Outside.co. And that deck, which is about 10 or 12 slides, sort of tells us a story through an arc. is a great example of you know the way to do it. And those usually are the deals that get funded, the ones that have the really good storytellers. Yep. Yep. As much as it's about the financials mm -hmm. of the business and how much money we could all make, yeah. in reality, people love a good story yep. and it helps them really understand the business. And yep. so practicing that pitch yep. over and over again, yeah. making sure they have the story straight yeah. so it's trustworthy. Right. You know, it's all the fundamentals and the simple things that I really think get the good entrepreneurs funded quickly. Right, and you know, any company has to have you know some numbers and you know there's uh, some basic fundamentals. But because these are startups that we're typically looking at, you know, maybe they launched within the past year, they're not going to have a huge track record, most likely, of numbers. But what they can have is a great story. So uh, that's where you can really make a difference as a founder in pitching your company is the story that you tell. And with our audience, that's the best part about it. They get to walk in and literally say, hey, I'm a marketer. Mm -hmm. I know how to bring users yeah. in. I can sell. Right. We can generate the revenue. Yeah. I just need help maybe building my product right. or uh, scaling my first team mm -hmm. or a lot of the things that a lot of the members in TCA yeah. have done time and time again. Yep. And that's one of the cool things I like about TCA is a lot of the members when a deal comes through in their field, will actually get hands on. Oh, yeah. They'll help the entrepreneurs. They'll advise yeah. them, uh, and they a lot of this they do out of the kindness of their heart, yeah. just because they really like the process. Yeah, that's right. We're a weird subculture of people that actually care and love this stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, that's why you choose to be an angel versus say an LP in some nameless fund. And some people are also you know uh, say LPs in venture capital funds. But I think when you choose to do angel investing, you're kind of signing up for a lifestyle and the big part of it is because you want to support these entrepreneurs. Sometimes you see yourself in these entrepreneurs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is what we're spending our free time right. doing right now. That's right. And I love going to the TCA meetings and working with entrepreneurs. It's yeah. a lot of fun. 
It's really educational. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you get to help people go after their dreams, which is that's really, right. really cool. Yeah. And that's why, again, it's really important that the entrepreneurs respect the people in the room yeah. who are willing to take a risk on them. Yeah. And it's a huge risk yeah. by showing up prepared yeah. and having all their shit together. Yeah. Don't make it hard for us to help you. I mean, that's the important <laughs> thing. And I had to say this to a couple companies last week because they missed, for example, a, a deadline they created to send me some collateral. And the point is, we want to help you, but don't make it hard for us to do that. Great advice. And when should founders reach out? So I think starting the conversation is a, you know, any point of entry that you can get. Maybe you meet at a mixer somewhere or um, you're at a conference or an event. Uh, but the actual formal presentation, you know, when you pull that trigger, um, you want to sort of have your ducks in a row and have your stars aligned to have the best story possible. So that's going to vary for every company. You know, I can't say that it should be after one month or nine months, it really depends. But what you want to have is momentum kind of behind your company, whether it's through you know users, whether it's through revenue, whether it's through other fundraising you're doing. So nothing gets an investor um, into a deal quicker than FOMO um, or you know sort of deal tension. Um, so we invest with other VCs and with other angels uh, in syndicated deals. Uh, when you're doing one, two million dollar financings, there's usually room for a couple people, uh, you know, a couple groups to be a part of that financing. So as an entrepreneur, you want to build the relationship uh, over time, if possible, but pull the trigger when you know it becomes a deal that nobody wants to miss. And on the SaaS side, I think it's important that they're beyond just an idea. Yeah, they need to have. Uh, maybe a minimum viable product with some beta users and people that can at least give feedback. Yes, yeah. not uncommon for an investor to want to call clients mm -hmm. and actually do a demo of the product and use the product yeah. and understand it yeah. so that they can get involved. Because yeah. I think one of the cool things about angels is they're looking for companies where they can help and yeah. use their life expertise right. in. And so they actually need something to sink, yep. sink, sink their teeth into. Yeah, yeah. And so if someone's going to apply with a deal and they have no product, yeah. nothing, just an idea, yeah. um, now is not the right time That's to right. go to an angel group. That's right. You've spoken like a man who's done a couple of these customer calls <laughs> and some, some diligence scrubbing. So in the SaaS world, I would say you know somewhere in the let's say few thousand dollars um, in you know, uh, MRR is a, definitely a, a good, you know, kind of time to come in. I mean, that's not a hard and fast rule, but if you're generating some recurring revenue and hopefully you're growing a little bit, um, that I think is a, you know, kind of a, a point of, you know, um, starting these formal conversations. And one of the things they should come with when they have the MRR is user acquisition metrics. Yep how they got the users, where the traffic's coming right. from, how they plan to scale them, yep. things that you and I typically have to explain yeah. to entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. but with the audience we have here, they already do this all day, every day. Right. And that's why we're really seeking out those yeah. deals that have the marketing talent, because yeah. they have all the metrics ready right. to go. And it makes it really easy on us to do due diligence yeah. and understand where their business is going. Yeah. Uh, I'm repeating myself here, but this is a big problem we face. Yeah. And so I'm excited that these people are going to see this. Well, it's worth repeating, because even though we repeat these you know, messages, and by the way, investors all over the internet repeat these messages, mm -hmm. the sequoias of the world. For some reason, we still get pitches every single day that <laughs> are not listening, you know, to these messages. So if you know your cost of customer acquisition and it's not negative, that's a good time to go to an investor because then we can look at it like adding fuel into a fire and we can visualize the growth. You don't need to already be on the rocket ship, you know, kind of, um, you know, curve. Uh, toward you know 10 10x growth, but we need to be able to visualize how our contributions can get you on that road. And the best way to do that is to be able to paint a picture through what you're doing right now, having positive unit economics. You know, then it's an easy math equation to do. And it falls right into the pitch story as well. Mm -hmm. We get to the part about where we're going yep. and the growth, and they show their hockey stick chart, yep. which almost 100% of <laughs> entrepreneurs do, even yeah. though they shouldn't. Yeah. At least the marketers can then explain, well, we're spending $20 to get a customer. We're making $80 right. on that customer. This is why we can see our growth. Right. And that's a really simple thing, but a, a very powerful one when told in a pitch. That's right. And the key to understanding and believing that hockey stick curve is let's say the last one, two, three months where you show that you've gotten a good grasp on what that um, cost of acquisition and lifetime value of customer will be. The flip side of that we see the artificial inflection point or what I call the Viagra hockey stick curve, which is <laughs> if you all invest in our company 
we are automatically going to 10x. But by the way, we haven't figured out what the cost of acquisition is going to be for us in the last week. So we're just magically going to uh, levitate, if you will. So have a good basis for why that curve is going to go into the hockey stick and up and to the right. And then that's what investors want to invest in. So they want reality. Right, exactly. As much as the hype is fun, yeah. reality is where deals get funded. Right. So storytelling and reality, obviously storytelling can sometimes be embellishing, you know, or creating a reality, but you want to have some basis. So it's a little bit of art and it's a little bit of science. Now the due diligence process that TCA goes through, mm -hmm. can you give me a little bit more information about what that process is like? Yeah what it feels like for the entrepreneur, because yeah. uh, sometimes it's not always fun, yeah. um, and just sort of prepare our audience for, for what that really looks like. Yeah, so I think there's two aspects to it. There's like the technical fundamentals, and then there's the sort of trust and relationship building of it, right? So focusing on sort of the technicalities, you're looking at things like the financing projections, um, like the history in financing, maybe other investors that have been in the deal. Um, the marketing plan is a huge part of what you're going to look at there because that, as an investor, you're investing in the future growth of the company. So mm -hmm. the marketing plan is is the story, you know, kind of, if you will. Um, as you're doing that, you're also interacting with this human being that is the entrepreneur or their team. And that's when you're trying to establish, you know, are they credible? It's somebody that we like working with, that will like working with us. Are they people that we feel like we can be helpful to? Are they coachable? You know, do they want to take feedback? So you have those sort of two aspects, I would say, to the due diligence process. One is sort of, you know, the numbers and the fundamentals and the technicalities. And the other is sort of the feel that you have with somebody. Because when you invest in a company, you're sort of signing up for a in the best case scenario, five to ten year, you know, horizon. That's typically how long it's going to take for one of these companies you know, to exit. Um, so that's a long term kind of partnership that you're engaging in. And, you know, me personally, with companies I've invested in, I'll take calls at any time. I mean, it could be Friday at six o'clock, and if that's the time that the founder can talk and I want to help, and I do, I'm going to take the call. You know, regardless. So uh, you want to make sure that there's kind of a fit in that relationship, and that's part of what due diligence is all about. So establishing the relationship, and I think. One of the most important parts of that is transparency. Yep. I don't know, but I'll find out mm -hmm. is a really good answer to any question. Because entrepreneurs want to have the answers, yeah. and so it always feels like sometimes they're trying to force out right. an answer when they don't have it, yep. and that's completely unnecessary. Yeah. Yep. We don't all have the answers, and it's more important to communicate honestly yeah. uh, and be transparent than it is to always have the answers. That's right. And you know, being open to uh, opening the kimono during that diligence is sort of what you should expect. So if you're getting asked questions and they're fair, you know, business questions, try not to be surly or kind of keep things too close to the chest because you're asking for somebody's money. And assuming that you're dealing with good investors, I like to think at TCA we are, um, we're not asking inappropriate questions. We're asking you questions like, how much have you grown in traffic over the past month? What are your, you know, daily active users? If you don't want to answer those questions, you're not ready for fundraising with anybody. Now, the actual diligence process, though, uh, can you shine some light on what types of deep information are going to be required for a funding process due diligence? Yeah, so thinking about, let's say, sort of SaaS, you know, kind of mm -hmm. in a little bit consumer internet companies, I mean, we're looking at web metrics, you know, kind of um, information on your conversion rates, your traffic, um, you know, retention, maybe some cohort analysis. Uh, how much money you're making off of each user and how much you're spending to get those users. So like basic hardcore, you know, kind of numbers that are assuming you've launched and you're generating some traction that should be pretty easy for you to share as a company. Uh, hopefully you're tracking those things because hopefully you're managing against those things. So that's why, you know, I don't think there's a huge chasm between what investors want to see during the diligence process and what the entrepreneur should be managing and reporting into their teams on a a weekly, if not daily, process to begin with. Then there's also the corporate stuff. So you know, we might be looking at things like the composition of the board, um, and again, who else is on the cap table, meaning other investors that have been part of the company in the past. Um, you know, sort of what the uh, financing plans are going forward. How much money is going to take to get this company to an exit? Um, you know, so there's business questions like that. But on the the product and sort of the the marketing side, these are all metrics that hopefully are your you know KPIs or key performance indicators that you're looking at as a founder every single day. And when a founder comes in and they're presenting their ask, mm -hmm. which is how much money they want to raise and what the deal terms are, yeah. whether it's an equity deal or a convertible note and the valuation. Mm -hmm. How should they come up 
with the valuation. And yeah. I want to preface this because we see such a wide yeah. range of valuations from undervalued to where they should be to yeah. the craziest valuations you could ever imagine. Yeah. You're laughing right now. Right. <laughs> Four. <laughs> that I saw you know, this morning. <laughs> exactly. And so how should an entrepreneur really value their company when coming to an angel group? Yeah. So I think there's sort of uh, idiosyncratic, you know, valuation variables, and then there's sort of market stuff, and it's some combination, you know, where at the end of the day, the investors know this is an early stage company, and you know, unlike a publicly traded company with you know PE multiples, you just can't, you know, home in and precisely on a number. So you have to kind of triangulate on some different figures. So let's talk about what some of those, you know, kind of um, indicators are. Well, one is within the company itself. If they have launched and if they've got some, you know, revenue, it's a little bit easier. You can take a look at like SaaS multiples, for example, of mm -hmm. other companies uh, when they got acquired or when they raised money at a similar stage, and then sort of you can back into what a fair valuation might be for your company today. So that that's one way of doing it. That only works again if you have some numbers, you know, that you can draw upon to be able to derive, you know, a number. If you're sort of pre-launch or you've launched pretty recently, it's a little bit harder. In those cases, I look mostly to comparables. Um, mm -hmm. So what stage are you at? Let's say I think or we think that a company is appropriate for the Y Combinator accelerator or, you know, sort of at that level. Well, you know what companies are valued at when they go into an accelerator. It's, you know, maybe two and a half million dollars if you just do the math on how much uh, equity Y Combinator, mm -hmm. let's say, takes for how much money they invest. So, you know, generally if you're sort of Pretty early stage, but there's something interesting there. You're probably going to be in the three million ish or so, you know, range. If you're a little bit beyond, let's say, what that accelerator stage is, you know, then you kind of look at again other companies in your space that have raised financing rounds. So they, you know, maybe haven't been acquired, but they've raised money from other investors like Sequoia, and mm -hmm. those deal terms have been disclosed. So you can kind of try and benchmark yourself against, you know, other companies in your space. Uh, so. There's generally, I would say, for every company, some type of reference that they can, you know, use, and that's part of your job as an entrepreneur to pick, you know, wisely. You want to have obviously, um, you know, kind of aspirational comparisons because your comparisons are generally going to be people that are succeeding. Um, but at the same time, you don't want them to be so aspirational that they're delusional. <laughs> so that's where you kind of your credibility, you know, and, and the, um, the the time that you take in as an mm -hmm. entrepreneur, your research comes into play. And then there's other market stuff, you know, so um, things like the Series A crunch that, you know, affect valuing companies, those are, you know, macro, you know, tech uh, investing sort of, um, you know, uh, climate factors that change over time. I mean, right now, for example, I would say valuations have been going down. So post Series A crunch that, you know, wiped out a lot of, you know, mezzanine, let's say tech startups, now companies are, you know, that were raising at a $10 million valuation might be raising at a, a six or a seven. And, Companies that were easily getting five million dollar valuations are raising at a two or a three. And as a founder, that's okay because the key thing to remember is it's not a success to raise money. Making money is how you get successful. Mm -hmm. Sure, raising money is a function on a path, hopefully, to making money into maybe selling your company or having some kind of liquidity event, but it's only a means to an end. And the problem is when you raise money at an inflated valuation, the chickens come home to roost eventually. Let's say that's the next round when other investors are coming in. If they see that you raised money at a ridiculous valuation, let's say a year ago, and the market hasn't, you know, isn't what attributes for this, you know, change, and they want to, they think it's fair, and the market thinks a lower valuation is, you know, is warranted. That means you're going to have a down round. So when you raise from unsophisticated investors who just put this high valuation, the founder feels good, you know, for six months. Well, you eventually have to justify that when you go to raise money again. And the worst thing to do, worse than not raising money at all, is having a down round. Because unless there's a really good reason for it, sometimes there are, um, it usually signals that something's not good with the company and you've lost a lot of leverage. So you want to raise at fair terms. That's the bottom line. I think good investors want to invest at fair terms and good founders want to raise at fair terms. When you have that you know, understanding, then it creates a winning environment for everybody. And when a company's pre-revenue, they haven't had any revenue yet, and yeah. they go for those really high valuations, yeah. if they launch and the revenue doesn't catch up to their yeah. projections, it just murders their future Absolutely. chances at fundraising, and that's a major problem. Yeah. Also, I think founders don't realize that angel investors or anyone coming in and putting in a significant amount of money, and I say significant at about half a million mm -hmm. to maybe $2 million, which is significant for a brand new startup right. that's small, small team. Um, 
that angel organization or those investors, they're going to want to have probably somewhere in the neighborhood to a 15 to 30 percent of the yep. company mm -hmm. for that. So regardless of valuation, the investors need to walk away with a large enough piece of the organization. Yeah. Otherwise, when a future fundraising round happens, they get diluted so small that yeah. they don't have a meaningful position in the company anymore. Right. Maybe that means they don't want to help anymore. Right. Um, and, and that's not a good thing. So yeah. as the, the founder, they need to be cognizant of that alone. And you can actually reverse engineer your valuation around that, which is a really simple way to do it. If you need half a million dollars and they need 25% of the company, yeah. we know we're at a $2 million valuation. This is real simple math. Um, and I think a lot of founders don't take the time to think about that. Yeah. And they come in, they give us a valuation, and then 15 minutes later, they're like, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. We'll do a different valuation. Right. Um, and that just says to the investors, they're not thinking about it. Right. And that's a warning sign. Right. Exactly, yeah. So a lot of this, again, is about trust and credibility. And if you have well thought out answers, even if there's no one right answer, you're going to check that box with the investor and we can move on to other considerations. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to ask for help, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you know this better than anyone else at TCA. Uh, entrepreneurs should ask for help. Mm -hmm. And if they're unsure, they should just say, I'm unsure. Can you give me a little bit of advice? Right. Because TCA, the members, they'll give it to them. Yep. Uh, and then usually that is the first sign that says this person's coachable. Yeah. We can work with this person right. as opposed to the entrepreneur who has their everything set in stone right. and is very demanding, hard to work with. Um, people don't want to work with assholes. Right. And people do want to work with people that get shit done. So there's probably mm -hmm. nothing more powerful than a company that comes, maybe they need some advice, they need some help. We help them figure out a plan of attack. Six months later, they come back and they say, by the way, guess what we just accomplished? It's ABC that we talked about doing six months ago. Uh, that's the way you get your company funded. Exactly. And at a higher valuation, the one the right. entrepreneur wants. Right. So maybe this conversation with an angel group like TCA should start six months before you're really mm -hmm. ready to fundraise. Yep. Show up, have a discussion, talk about what you're doing and where you're going, yep. and then circle back around when you need the funding. Right. And then say, hey guys, look, I did exactly what I said I was going to do. I exceeded expectations. Yeah. Here's what we did. I'm ready to finally get some funding. That's right. And, you know, we're in the community. You know, so it's our job to be accessible. You know, so we get probably three, four, five pitch decks a day, but we formally might look at five to ten companies a month. What are we doing with all the other pitch decks and founders that we're interacting with? What we are we doing with all Building this? relationships. <laughs> <laughs> And we're, and we're keeping track of them, you know, and, and you know, through different, you know, means um, to be able to initiate those conversations. So then, when you know the the clock starts ticking, um, then we already have some context and you know some um, you know a foundation uh, to to build upon. And I think my favorite thing about an entrepreneur is when they show up and they have their own skin in the game. Oh yeah. And they're not shy about it. They didn't take only friends and family money, maybe they sacrificed everything they had, yep. maybe they sold their car. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, yeah. but they needed to put whatever they could into their company mm -hmm. to get it to that point. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of respect for that yeah. because it takes a lot of work and a lot of commitment. And then if you give that entrepreneur money, at least you know they're not going to squander it on nonsense. Yeah. And uh, if they fail, they lose everything. That's right. Um, and it's going to hurt. Yep. And so that, that may sound predatory, but it's really not. It just signifies mm -hmm. who the hustlers are. Right. Yeah. And I know so many hustlers in the affiliate, in the marketing world, who've bootstrapped what they've done, who've tried a million things, mm -hmm. who've suffered and then succeeded. And I never see these guys coming in for funding anywhere or building real businesses. And so really my goal with this conversation, and I hope it shines through, is that these marketers and affiliates out there have the potential to build amazing businesses, big ones, they can acquire the users, they're super clever, they're yeah. super smart, and these are the entrepreneurs that we really want to see, and they're so rare outside of the marketing industry yeah. um, that hopefully we'll start to attract them in because um, they have more potential than any other type of entrepreneur I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. Yeah, gritty, scrappy, resourceful, those are the kind of things we want to see in successful founders. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come over here and meet. If an entrepreneur wants to get a hold of Tech Coast Angels yeah. and apply, how do they do it? 
So they could start by going to our website, tcasandiego.com. Um, there, you know, we kind of go through some of the mechanics, reviewing some of what we talked about, you know, today. I'm always accessible as well, so you can find me on social media. It's ak underscore launch the year is my Twitter handle. Ashok at techcoastangels.com is my email address. You don't have to guess to figure out uh, what it is. And, and again, I'm always open to meeting entrepreneurs. I'm interested in the marketing tech space. And when I say I, I'm speaking for Tech Coast Angels. I think it's an area where there's a lot of innovation. Uh, to me, marketing is sort of the new tech. Um, it's not just about having a great idea. It's about how are you going to make money. And marketing is becoming so sophisticated. It is becoming the technology. And it's an area that there's good M&A you know, acquisition activity as well with some of the bigger companies buying these sort of startups. So I think marketing tech companies are one of the areas that we're interested in seeing from. And if you're one of those people, get in touch with us. <laughs> and by the way, this doesn't mean you have to be located in San Diego. Tech Coast Angels, especially the San Diego chapter, is willing to hear entrepreneurs from anywhere in the United States that's looking for funding. So please, by all means, contact Ashok, contact Tech Coast Angels. We want to meet you and we want to help you take your company to the next level. Thank you again for being here. Thanks, Thanks for watching baby. the Paper Collar Show. Let us know what you think by joining the conversation and commenting below. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe. And if you're on mobile, tap the bell. Whether you're new to Paper Call or an industry veteran, we invite you to join the free community at papercallers.com. This episode of Paper Callers is brought to you by Ringba Call Tracking and Analytics. See how Ringba is inventing the future of calls at ringba.com. See you next week.